Okay. Um, for, for those that are there, we don't have any slides and we don't have any video. So uh, the, the goal here is just to have a open Q and A with Harvey and myself. So I don't know, do, do you want to just give a brief intro Harvey of who you are and then I can, I can do the same. Sure. I'm Harvey Took. I work at uh, Google on uh, Envoy platform. So uh, I'm interested in taking Envoy and making you do that in our organization and also supporting Envoy as an open source project. I'm a senior maintainer. And I've been heavily involved in Envoy in a number of areas, mostly around APIs, the XPS protocol, as well as security and um, some amounts of just basic infrastructure and, and so on. Matt? Thanks. My name is Matt Klein. I'm a software engineer at Lyft, where I started the Envoy proxy project about five and a half years ago, um, and then led it through open source a bit over four years ago. Uh, and now I split my time, about 50-60% of my time is open source work around Envoy and CNCF and the cloud native ecosystem. And then the other 50% of my time is infrastructure leadership at Lyft. So uh, again, this is a really an open-ended Q&A, so happy to talk about just about anything. So there's a Q&A box that's, I think, in that you can answer questions or you can ask questions in, and uh, we can wait for some questions and just go from there. So hopefully, hopefully folks will have a question. Feel free to type away. Guess if we don't have any questions in a, a minute or two, we can we can seed it with some other questions. <laughs> Let me see if there's. Uh... All right. First question, uh, are there any plans uh, to introducing quick or HTTP3 support into Envoy? Would you like to take that, Harvey, or would you like me to? I think you're, you're better off taking that one. I mean, I, I think the answer is yes. But so yes. I think yeah. we are more close to the exact status of, of where we are because we had a question in our previous maintainer session around the documentation and stability and examples. And I think that's what the community is really looking to actually understand right now. Sure. Um, so obviously Quick and HTTP3, at least the IETF version is still in the process of being ratified. I think it's very close. Um, Quick obviously came out of Google. So Google has been using Quick in production for quite some time. We're, we're very fortunate with Envoy where the team that shipped Quick at Google also works on Envoy. And historically, the way that the code worked is it was part of the Chromium code base. So it was already open source. Um, but in the interest of making it easier to consume in Chrome, as well as Envoy, as well as other projects, it's been uh, moved out to a different library called Quiche. And uh, there's a team of people that have been working on integrating that into Envoy for actually quite some time. I think they've been working on it for six or nine months. And I, I believe it's very close to an MVP. I think there are people that are, that are actually standing it up now. And I think one of the maintainers Greg is actually working on it now, not at Google. So I think there are people that are pretty actively working on it. We don't have documentation yet, but um, the, the, the support is planned. It'll support the old Google Quick. It'll support the, support the IETF Quick. Oops, sorry, my phone is beeping. Um, but it will, uh, you know. Uh, could everyone mute themselves who's on the conference bridge? Yeah, I just I just closed mine. Maybe it wasn't mine. Anyhow, um, so it it is coming. And uh, I, I, I think that uh, hopefully we'll have some documented support soon. So let's see. Uh, next. 
So next question is, um, are either of you involved in the Windows port of Envoy? Neither of us is really involved. H happy to give a brief brief status update there, um, but I'm not sure if that's something that you want to talk to Harvey or if you want me to take that one too. Yeah, I, mean, I think the Envoy for the definitive sort of status, uh, I recommend looking at the, watching the Envoy Con 2020 talk uh, on this, and uh, this is all up it's, um, uh, on YouTube right now. Um, I think uh, we now have uh, pretty significant progress there. It's sitting it. Um, it's uh, most of the tests are actually passing. But there's a, still a backlog of tests which you need to pass. There is. Um, a bit of work being done on tooling and CI to make sure it's possible to actually make maintainable um, significant investment from VMware and Microsoft. Um, I don't know if anyone's actually using it in production yet. Um, Matt, have you? Have you, you know, I think the answer is pr probably not because the current implementation, because of the edge triggered versus level triggered mm -hmm. situation, yeah. it doesn't perform very well. So I, I think it is functionally complete, meaning it, it has all the features, but it does not perform well. Uh, and that's just related to how uh, how event triggering works within Windows and the team is working on that currently. So I, I think their goal is by the end of the year to have something that performs well for a beta version. All right, let's see. Uh, new to CNCF, what is Envoy? That's probably a, a good thing to cover, I don't know. You want to give like a 60 second overview, Harvey, of what is Envoy? Oh, well, I mean, what's the pitch on the website? Envoy is a cloud native service mesh proxy or something like that. But basically, uh, what I think of Envoy is actually is um, it's even in a number of different respects. It provides um, um, L4, L7 load balancing and proxying a uh, data plane for this. It's a central component of um, many service meshes. So you'll see it as part of things like Istio and also, it's used in a number of just like very bespoke applications, like for example, building edge load balancers for very large organizations or um, cloud native companies. Um, one thing I like to think about, of, the perspective I like to take of Envoy is it's really is a platform and it's uh, what really distinguishes it from many of the other proxies and load balancers in this space is its extensibility. It has both an extensible data plane with various uh, extension points and also a control plane built around open APIs. And these are the XDS protocol uh, APIs and protocol that you may hear about in association with uh, Envoy and uh, things like Istio. And this is where a lot of the power of uh, uh, Envoy comes about in that it, uh, it enables entire ecosystems of extensions and um, other components such as control planes and management servers to uh, interoperate with it. So. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure, you, um, Matt, uh, as, as the founder, you you have a particular take as well, right? Uh, sure. No, I, I think that was a that was a great overview. I, I I think what I typically say to this question is, if you're looking for projects that it's most similar to, it's going to be most similar to other software load balancers like Nginx and HAProxy. You know, that's that's the most similar thing that you would compare it to. And Envoy has become very popular um, because of a bunch of the features around how it does configuration and extensibility and the community that we've built. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a software load balancer. All right, let's see. Uh, next question. I have a file access log question. I am currently using the file access log in my filter for a gRPC service. Um, and it's creating thousands of access logs per minute. Is there a way to limit that? Uh, yes, there are various ways of limiting it. I would take a look at uh, what Envoy calls runtime support, which basically allows you to do stable sampling. Um, so you can sample access logs, I think, to one in a million or one in 10,000, and there's various filters that you can use to limit the log output. Mark that one answered. Uh, let's see, answer, answer live. Okay. And let's see, uh, next one. What, uh, let's see, what are your favorite or the most interesting uses of XDS Relay? Um, I'll, I'll talk briefly and then I'll let Harvey talk also. So XDS Relay, for those that don't know, uh, it's, a, it's basically an 
XDS caching proxy. So you could think of it as like varnish for XDS. And, you know, a bunch of the problems that people have when they're trying to run Envoy or other XDS compliant proxies is it can be difficult to write control planes. It's just, it's not, it's not, it's not super simple. So our goal with that project is to make it easier for people to write scalable control planes, similar to how people frequently run CDNs in front of their HTTP origin servers. We believe that there's an opportunity to have a, a common caching layer that can offer, um, you know, distributed systems, best practices around things like back pressure and rate limiting and all of those things. And then also more advanced functionality around things like subsetting um, or uh, implementing incremental XDS and things like that. So the project is in early stages. We're currently deploying it in production at Lyft right now, and we're hoping to get more people involved. But I'll, I'll let Harvey answer too, because he's interested in all this API stuff. Yeah, I, I would definitely say one of the compelling use cases that I think is a pretty high priority in XDS Relay Roadmap is this idea of bridging state of the world updates, which, you know, very relatively simple configuration pipelines and control planes can speak and dealing with the nuances around Delta and uh, even on demand uh, XDS updates. Uh, I don't think that's like their immediate goal. Um, I think um, the XDS protocol itself is actually starting to build in more capabilities in uh, sort of first class support for cacheability as we go for scalability. And you can see this in things like um, very recently a TTL was introduced, which uh, is, 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 is pretty important from that perspective. But also um, we we have a, a, a new sort of URL based naming scheme inside XDS, which will be uh, capable of really modeling XDS resource names as cache keys and make things like XDS Relay um, that much, I guess, easier to use and more effective. Um, I think, you know, XDS Relay and, and things like this are going to be super important as we talk about scale um, out uses of XDS in areas when, such as, uh, for example, Edge uh, XDS. So when things like um, Envoy Mobile uh, adopts XDS, which it doesn't today, but as, as it does, this kind of um, application of XDS Relay, as well as other more traditional CDN kind of methods of distributing caching, uh, the cacheable resources will be, I think, pretty important. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's kind of like a Swiss army knife, essentially, of uh, control plane capabilities, uh, um, which, you know, can be used for this uh, fan out capability. That's the way I see it. All right, next question. Uh, is there a plan to incorporate latency-based load balancing like Linker, Ds, EW, MA? Um, I don't know of anyone that has uh, been interested in implementing this so far. All of Envoy's load balancing systems are actually pluggable, so it wouldn't be terribly hard for someone to implement this. We just need someone to come forward and do so. I, I think my experience with the latency-based load balancing systems is, is that, you know, I mean, they add a bunch of complexity and it's not clear that they add enough value to warrant, warrant the complexity, but we would certainly be open to having those be implemented if there's people that would want to implement them. Uh, let's see, next tab. Any tips if I want or need to write a control plane for Envoy from scratch? I'll, I'll let Harvey take that one. Yeah, so I, I think you definitely uh, almost certainly want to use something like Go control plane or Java control plane as your basic um, uh, transport, um, like library for handling. Uh, and obviously it depends upon which language you intend to use to implement your control plane. But this is essentially what many of the users in the community have converged around. And there is a lot of code there for reuse and many of the hard lessons have been solved there. Um, another question obviously is like, you know, why do you want to build a control plane? There's, and there's many good reasons for building another control plane, in particular when folks have, you know, in-house control planes for existing hardware or software load balancers and they're uh, adopting Envoy. Um, but there is also um, a number of um, open source and commercial uh, control plane offerings as a service. And so understanding that full space is probably very important before you know, embarking on this uh, uh, effort. But uh, I would definitely start by uh, uh, taking a look at one of those libraries. Uh, Matt, do you have any other suggestions? 
Um, no, I, I think I would just echo the same thing, which is I would really not recommend writing a control plane from scratch at this point. I, I think between the API gateway solutions and the service mesh solutions that are out there, I would really recommend starting from, from something open source, even if it requires it to be customized. So, uh, next question, where do you stand on the Spire integration? I don't. I don't know really what that means. So if the person that asked that want, want, wants to clarify, I, I think when it comes to Spiffy and Spire, Envoy doesn't really have any direct dependencies on things like Kubernetes or, or Spiffy and Spire. It's a pretty generic solution, you know, that can interoperate with different certificate providers and different ways of specifying uh, principles and RBAC rules and all of those things. So I think we're very open to obviously integrating with different um, different authentication authorization providers and it's a pretty, pretty pluggable system. So I think we're open to it. I don't know, did you have anything to add there, Harvey? No, I don't think so. I mean, other than to point out that, yeah, as, as you point out, like as I, Matt had also mentioned before, you know, part of Envoy's extensibility extends to things like certificate providers and we have a, uh, recently added mechanism to uh, sort of uh, very flexibly add in uh, additional sources of certificate providers. Yeah. Right. Uh, next question. Are there interesting public overlaps using open API and Envoy? Um, I can answer this. I'm not sure if this is something that you know about Harvey, if you want to answer this at all, or do you want me to take this? So I, I think from an open API perspective, I'm not an expert. I don't think there are any explicit overlaps right now. What I will say is that Envoy does, I would say, quite a lot already with API transcoding. So particularly around gRPC to JSON and, and things like that. And I think there's an entire ecosystem brewing, particularly around protobuf and gRPC APIs of how annotations, you know, can be added to APIs to allow them to be shared across different ecosystems. So whether that be something like Swagger or open API or uh, gRPC and automatic conversion between gRPC and JSON and YAML. So I, I don't know that Envoy at least initially would be involved in this, but I do think that over time, we're gonna see more convergence in how people define APIs. I think there'll be an increased movement towards IDL. And then I think as people move towards IDL, I, I believe that we can, one of the complaints against IDL based APIs is they tend to be harder to consume. Like it requires more tooling and a bit more expertise. And I think that Envoy can help bridge the gap between people that are, you know, maybe potentially used to using curl based, you know, rest APIs and, and how we can uh, programmatically define them and then have them be more accessible to the developers. So, yeah, uh, let's see. Let's see, we already talked about the Windows port. So I, I think that's ongoing. I'm thinking that they're gonna have something by the end of the year, hopefully that's beta ready. So hope, it's already feature ready, but it's not production performance ready. So so that will be coming. There's a question on how broad the adoption of yeah. online mobile is outside of Lyft. So there's no one else using it so far that I know of. Uh, and you know, to be clear with Envoy Mobile, we open sourced it really at the very beginning before there wasn't there wasn't really anything. So it was developed in the open. So we are uh, finishing our production rollout by by the end of the year. So if you're using Lyft, most rides and functionality now are already go going over on by mobile. Uh, we've had a lot of, quite a bit of interest from other large companies. I, I can't speak to any of them now, but I'm expecting broader adoption in 2021, uh, but we'll have to see how it goes. I'm still very bullish on the technology. I think the goal of the project, which is to share the networking stack everywhere, tends to resonate with people. And this comes back to actually what we were talking about before about the open API aspect, which is I think when you look at defining APIs and look at them end to end from the client to the server, I think there's very interesting functionality that we can provide if we own the end to end networking stack. Yeah, very exciting announcement that it transferred to the Envoy Proxy organization uh, just the other day, yep. right? Yeah. Yep, 
yeah, that, that happened now. So now it's it's along with Envoy. And I would expect us to, to use that over time to better integrate the CI systems of both projects, hopefully hopefully make things make things better. Um, let's see. Uh, any plan to support additional languages natively beyond C++ without using WebAssembly? I don't know. That's something that you've probably been thinking about, Harvey, if you want to take that one. Yeah, so I think... I mean, we, we've seen over time, uh, unofficially, there, there's been um, other attempts to build things like Go filters and, and, and this kind of thing. I think WebAssembly is probably one of the key uh, places that most of the community is going to head towards because it provides uh, a very stable interface and ABI for building these kinds of integrations. And it's kind of, you know, highly aligned with the idea of multi-language support. We have opened a tracking issue around Rust use in Envoy. And this is a place where I think uh, if anyone's interested in contributing, we would definitely be interested in trying to see what's possible. It's unclear whether we would be able to offer, for example, the same level of, uh, sort of integration as existing um, C++ extensions to Rust code, largely because of this problem of um, you know, essentially the foreign function interface, uh, you know, Rust is a more like C-like abstraction level and um, it's it's kind of hard to make it work well with C++ and there's just generally an, a, an open issue in, in the Rust community around that. But we're definitely interested in, you know, potential novel uses of Rust. I mean, one thing I would point out is that we actually have a pretty large array of extensibility options in Envoy now and that folks approaching, you know, building an extension for Envoy can choose between you know things like the traditional c native filters we have uh, web assembly we have things like um web assembly with null vm which allows you to write c filters against the stable web assembly abi we also have um uh lure obviously um, we have things like um network-based filters which it can be also a very attractive uh, design uh, point in the design space and so examples of these include things like um Already in Envoy X AuthC is actually a protocol which is used to build a whole bunch of integrations beyond just, let's say, authorization, because you're basically able to intercept requests and operate on their headers. Um, and going forward, we have actually right now in the process uh, this great contribution uh, from uh, Greg Braille, which is going to be around uh, something called an external processing filter, which will essentially allow you to build um, a filter which is able to participate in the full Envoy request and response lifecycle as a gRPC service. And so obviously that means anything that you implement which is, sits behind um, a gRPC uh, uh, stub for this uh, service um, can, uh, can actually then provide this functionality. Um, so that's actually a pretty uh, interesting and, and novel uh, space for like you know, multi-language support and so on. Yeah. Yep. I, I think in general, just, just to summarize, I don't think we're opposed to having other languages, right? It's like if someone actually wanted to figure out how to upstream Go filters or whatever else, I, we're not opposed to it, but it's pretty hard to actually make this work. It's a substantial amount of effort um, and it's un unclear that someone's gonna be willing to do that. So I think it really depends on, on the overall community and ecosystem and my experience has been that for the vast majority of use cases, when rubber meets the road, C++ works, Lua works, and I think WebAssembly will end up working for, for most people. So I, I'm just skeptical that people will actually put up put up the work other, other than Rust, because I think Rust is the future. So, yeah. Okay, let's see, there's another question here. Um, sorry if this is a vague question. <clears throat> we manually set up Envoy for two services uh envoy egress envoy ingress we have uh seen upstream connect error or disconnect before headers um when under load we are seeing the error occurrence decrease when we increase the cluster connect timeout is it a good idea to keep the connect timeout to be the same for all services any idea or guideline about what is happening to be honest it's really hard to you know, comment or debug this type of thing remotely over over conference video. So I, I would encourage you to you know, either file file an issue or hop into Envoy Slack. I would say in in general, I mean, from what you're saying is that 
it's not surprising to me that under load, you know, things take longer to connect and you, you might have to raise the timeouts. So at the end of the day, with a lot of the timeouts, um, you know, that you can set in Envoy, you're trying to balance performance with overall availability. And the only way to really tune that is going to be to look at your particular use case and do low testing and figure out what type of error budget you are comfortable with, depending on the load that you're taking. We're out of questions. Feel free to type in some more. Oh, apparently there's another page. I think these are covered in this other page. Oh yeah, no, I think I, I think I, I filtered all the answered questions. So I think we're, I think we've done them all. Uh, yeah, I think so. Maybe I'll uh, see the question then, Matt. So what are you most excited for in uh, the coming year in Envoy? What uh, what am I most excited for? Um, I think I'm excited for WebAssembly. I, I really do think that is the future of extensibility. Um, so I am very excited for that one. And um, I'm excited for Quick and HTTP3. Um, excited for I think a bunch of the work that we're going to do in the Envoy mobile space. Um, I'm excited for our general, you know, general continued focus on security. So I think that's something where we've, you know, we've made great strides, and there's always always more to do. It's a very messy space. Uh, I think those are the things that come to mind. I will I'll turn it around and ask you the same question. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just definitely agree with you on that space. I mean, just generally extensibility in general, I think, you know, we're going to see um, a continued growth um, in terms of extensibility in many different levels, whether it's, um, uh, you know, it's how people are building Envoy extensions, it's how we're constructing the API and, you know, making that built around the concept of extensibility and less, fewer sort of baked in concepts. I think, um, I'm generally sort of a bit gung ho about the work that I'm currently involved in around trying to improve uh, things like scalability, cacheability, federation support, this kind of stuff in XDS, and sort of trying to open it up to a, uh, a wider audience. And I think it'll be very interesting to see other the XDS ecosystem grow as a whole as we see um, additional proxies and um, uh, data plane components jump on board. And I think that's we definitely will see, you know, in the previous year we saw GRPC join. I think we're going to see quite a few more folks uh, come on board in uh, 2021. So, uh, yeah, those, those are things that I'm definitely very excited about. And I, I think, like, on the security front, I'm very interested to see uh, more. What, what will be exciting is seeing more uh, folks and companies sort of getting involved and contributing there because I think we, we're starting to see um, this um, happening and it's actually really great to see security becoming a uh, sort of common responsibility and something which uh, many uh, companies are sort of giving back to the Envoy community with. Yep. Uh, let's see. What efficiency gains has Lyft made by implementing Envoy? Uh, you know, that's a tough one to answer, right? Because I'm not sure what efficiency uh, this person is talking about. Are we talking about like compute efficiency or person efficiency? And to be honest, it's really hard to answer that because Envoy was developed relatively early on in at, at Lyft to solve a bunch of problems around the around the microservice rollout, and it certainly satisfied those goals. But at this point, Envoy is so intertwined with everything that Lyft does; it, it's hard, you know, it's hard to go back five years and, and understand what it would 
mean to unwind that. I mean, it's not, it's, it, it's not really possible. So I think that at least from the initial goals, we started the project five and a half years ago, it was honestly mostly around developer productivity. It wasn't really around like machine performance. Uh, and I think the goal was to make it easier to do the microservice rollout. And I think from that perspective, the microservice rollout went from being stalled to being successful. So I, I think I would, I would, I would measure it more on the developer productivity side of things. So let's see. Um, has anyone put Envoy proxy in front of the Kubernetes API server? Don't know. Uh, do you know Harvey? Don't know. Yeah. Let's see. Um, could you discuss some of the differences uh, between Envoy and Istio? Would you like to take that one, Harvey? <laughs> this a lot from uh, even folks at Google who are sort of ramping up an Envoy because the two are sometimes sort of treated synonymously. And um, so the way I would describe this is Istio is a, a complete service mesh offering. And Envoy is the data plane component there. It's the sidecar proxy and also using, you know, things like the, um, you know, edge uh, sort of egress ingress proxy that, that form that, that is used as a, as a building block as part of Istio. So Istio includes many other things beyond just uh, Envoy in terms of things like, you know, a CA, um, a, a policy engine, um, a, a configuration and control management system. So all these things are sort of what uh, constitutes Istio. So you can think of like Envoy as being a single proxy, which you would have like as a, as a single node or a single like say pod in it, like Istio. And Istio is really the, 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 the whole network, the comprehensive service mesh offering there. Um, yeah. Anything to add, Matt? Or? <laughs> no. I think, uh, you know, I, I think it's uh, the control plane versus data plane discussion. And I, I think yeah. Envoy is, I'm biased, but it's becoming the de facto data plane. Uh, but we see lots of different control planes on top. Yeah. Let's see. Are there any sample Go filters which we can use as a template? So like I was saying before, there's no upstream Go filter support. There have been a couple of projects that have done it. I know that... Cilium has done it, but it's not upstream. I think there's a couple other companies that have done it, but nothing is upstream. I know that they're working on a tiny go WebAssembly runtime. So, you know, that might be an option, but other than that, I, I don't think there's anything really out there. Uh, I think we're almost out of time. So let's see, we can take another couple. Is there any integration between Envoy and eBPF? Not directly, but if you look at Cilium, again, they're doing a lot of stuff with eBPF and Envoy. So I would I would look at them. Uh, and trying to look through if there's anything we can do quick. I don't know. Uh, what is the what are the weirdest and surprising use cases of Envoy that you've seen? I don't know. Is there anything that we can, can end on that? Anything that comes to mind with you, Harvey? I'm trying to think. Um Weirdest and most surprising. Um, uh, I, well, I, I, I'm not sure if I, I have any super surprising ones. One thing I, I'll notice is as you browse the web increasingly these days or use certain um, platforms, you'll, you may occasionally see no healthy upstreams and you notice onboard popping up in various places which uh, you uh, wouldn't expect. Yeah, I think I would say the same thing. It's just, it's everywhere, right? And so it's like, it's used in telecom and internet and like finance, and it's just all over the place. So I think the most surprising thing for me is, is just how widely it's been deployed. And it's deployed all over the place from service mesh to internal load balancer to API gateway. So from a project perspective, it's really fantastic to, to see all that growth. So. I think we're uh, about at time. So for all of these other questions, I think there's a there's an Envoy chat room in CNCF Slack. There's an Envoy Slack. Happy to happy to answer questions there. So thank you. Okay. All right. Bye.